right. Well, last week we looked at some principles that were related to the waging industry, principles from Scripture that would help us think rightly about the wagering industry. They were principles that hopefully give us some kind of a framework to use as we examine this particular topic. Uh, first, we looked at the issue of stewardship. Uh, the main principle there is that God is the creator of all things, and he has given in his creation man dominion over all the rest of his creation, and that man bears God's image as man exercises stewardship and dominion over all that God has given him. But we also looked at the issue of contentment and uh, how the Christian is to find their contentment first and foremost in Christ, in who he is, and not in their circumstances or in the shape or the color or the size of their provision, but in Christ himself. And that has implications for us in how we think about all of the things that are in front of us, uh, particularly the topic of wagering today. And then lastly, we looked at the idea of worship and how it is that God calls the believer to worship him in, in every aspect of their lives, and, and primarily to be thinking about the return of Christ and how we can be living today in a way that anticipates Christ and makes us ready for his return and makes us uh, eager to value and prize and look with value upon the things that are, that are coming in the next age, more so than what we have here today. Uh, today we're going to spend most of our time looking at a few questions that are common as Christians think about a subject like wagering. We're going to spend most of our time examining some questions and, and seeing how principles from Scripture speak into those issues. Uh, but first, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, two issues that are important for us to consider uh, as we think about this or any other issue like this. And the majority of our topic today is going to be talking about wagering, but we want to remember that we have these principles in front of us, and, and we need to be careful to apply these principles uh, to our lives in various areas of our lives, whatever those areas are. These same principles apply. What we're going to do here is we're going to look at two deceptions that are very, very prevalent, uh, especially as it relates to the wagering or the gambling industry. And the first issue, the first principle that we want to keep in front of us is that sin never satisfies. Sin never satisfies. It, it always leaves us with an inner craving for more. And uh, one of the passages that is helpful in us understanding this is Proverbs 27, uh, verse 20. Solomon writes, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. These are the wise words of Solomon written again under the inspiration of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And he writes to us and he tells us that God did not design us to be satisfied with sin. Uh, the ongoing pursuit of sin is not because we've found sin to be satisfying, we want more of it. Uh, the sinner pursues sin continually because he's looking for the satisfaction that the sin itself doesn't actually provide. And so he continues to pursue the sin, looking for the satisfaction, but it's never there, and it's a cycle that just continues to, to go on. And that's particularly relevant as we consider the, the gambling and the wagering industry. Uh, casinos and betting houses know this very well, and they use that significantly. Um, so often the person who wins is compelled to win more, and the logic works like this. It goes, well, if I've been winning to this point... Um, I will find my satisfaction when I win more. But what's really happening is that the winning itself is not truly satisfying. And the person continues to play because the, the satisfaction really isn't accomplished. There's some other words from Solomon that are very helpful, this time in, in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 5. Solomon writes, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. And the truth there is that God simply didn't design us to be satisfied by the resources. Uh, he designed us to be satisfied with himself. And last week, we looked at a passage from Philippians 4 that helps us understand that. And it's good for us to review that as we prepare to answer some of the questions that we're going to walk through this morning. Philippians 4, verse 5, very, very helpful. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. And the Lord there is Christ. Verse 7, two verses later, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. So the Lord is near. God guards us, guards our hearts and our minds in the person of Christ himself. So we find our satisfaction in the fact that Christ is near. 
We find our satisfaction in the fact that God guards our, heist, our hearts in Christ. Our satisfaction is found in the person of Christ. It's not found in the materials and the things that God has put here for us to enjoy. It's found in the person who created those things. So one of the principles we need to make sure we understand and we, we keep in mind in all of these things is that sin itself never satisfies. And we're considering wagering this morning, but it, it applies to any area of our life, whatever the area is. The second warning, the second caution we want to put in front of us, one of the deceptions that's especially relevant in the wagering industry is that the path to destruction wears a very attractive mask. The path to destruction wears an attractive mask. I'm going to start with a passage from Proverbs 5 that relates to the adulteress. Then we're going to move from that topic to another one, but it's, it's very helpful because it makes it able for us to see the way that the enemy works in our lives. I'm going to read several verses from Proverbs 5, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. The lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet take hold of death. Her steps go down to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, and she doesn't know it. The enemy, Satan, has an objective. He has an ultimate objective, and that is to destroy a person, uh, to lure that person into Sheol, and the terminus here, the, the end point is not just the grave. It's a place of permanent destruction at the hands of God. That's what his objective is. So what he does is he presents the adulteress. She's available. She's ready. She's attractive. But in that, his ultimate objective is still to destroy the individual. And that will surely come to pass if the man takes the bait. But the same principle is at play here in wagering. We all recognize the, the magnitude of what is taking place with the adulteress, but the same magnitude is at work with wagering or anything else. Satan presents an opportunity for the person to actually enhance their position financially, to enhance their provision through some means other than what God has deemed and God has prescribed. And that's pretty attractive on the surface. And so what Satan is distorting here is the source of man's pleasure or his satisfaction. He wants to deceive man into believing that there is greater pleasure to be had in obtaining provision from some way other than what God has prescribed rather than the way that God has prescribed. Last time we looked at this verse, and I think this verse is very helpful. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Solomon writes, There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that is from the hand of God, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? So God's design for man's good involves labor within the context of a relationship with him. You see in verse 24 that man's labor is good. And at the end of verse 25, there is no enjoyment in that labor without God and apart from God. We bear God's image by working in the same way that God worked for six days in creation, because that is what is good. The enemy presents to us the lie that provision outside of work will somehow be better than provision within work, provision within that same diligent hard work. And we think about what's more appealing to our flesh, to earn a few hundred dollars at a casino one night, or to earn that same amount of money by working hard all day as God has designed for us. Well, our flesh would love to earn those resources and earn that money by something other than what God has prescribed because it's easier. And we looked at this verse last week as well, but it's helpful as we think about it with regards to gambling or wagering. Ephesians 4, 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but he must labor performing with his hands what is good. Paul writes that the man must labor there's an active verb there. He must actually work. He must labor, performing with his hands what is good. That means that we're using the resources of our mind, the, the abilities, the attributes that God has given to us to do what is good, to do something that provides a benefit to ourselves or to others. Where wagering comes up short is that it doesn't provide any material substance. It doesn't provide what is good to anybody. Anybody. 
Uh, so to aim to enhance your provision through a means that doesn't provide any true benefit simply lies outside of God's design for our provision. And to remain in that practice for any length of time will eventually bring out the destruction that Satan has had in mind all along. So we want to remember that the path to destruction wears a very, very attractive mask. It looks really, really good, but its end is destruction. So we're going to consider several questions this morning, and we're hopefully going to use these principles that we've been looking at to help us. One of the questions that, that arises very often with a person who thinks about this on the surface is, how is wagering different from investing? And you can see where what would motivate this question, because... Um, what appears to be a similarity between the two is you look at them and, and in neither one can you tell the outcome. Uh, you consider a wagering on a, an event like a game and you really don't have any understanding of the outcome of that beforehand. And in the same way, you can't really forecast the performance of some mutual fund or some stock over the course of a year. So in that way, the, the two activities appear to be very similar, but that's where the similarities end. And the gist of this or the thrust of this is that investing involves giving money to a company and that company can use that, those resources for research and development. When an individual invests in a company, they, they give resources to a company and they use those for the betterment of their company. Most companies do one of two things. They either provide goods or they provide services. If they're a company that provides goods, they use capital that you invest in them to make better goods or to make their goods better. We can see that. We see that products are increasingly good with time. Cars are getting to be better cars. And other things are made in a way that's more efficient and better. It's cheaper to produce the same thing because a person uh, invested capital in that company. And that's a net benefit. That's a net benefit to the consumers of those products. Or for a company that provides services, when an individual invests capital in that, that company, they use that capital to learn how to make those services better, how to improve their services. And those are a net benefit to us as well. You can see that in many, many ways. Uh, the internet was developed probably about 1970. But about 30 years later, we figured out how to use the internet to do things like reservation systems for the airline industry. Uh, doing that, if, you've, if you made airline reservations 35, 40 years ago, you know what a challenge it was. You look at it today, it's much easier. It's very, very simple. And that's because people invested capital in companies and they used that to figure out how to build websites and how to do things that were more helpful. So investment and investing provides capital that, that has a, a net benefit, either in terms of goods or in terms of services to the people who invest in, and into mankind as general. We looked at Genesis 128 last week as well. God blessed man and he said to man, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God blessed man so that he could subdue the earth. And subdue the earth is using the resources God gave him, the way in which God blessed him, so he could use those resources that would be a benefit to himself and to others around him. And this is where wagering comes up very, very short. And it's very, very different because it provides no net benefit to an individual. There's no net benefit that comes to it in terms of goods or services. So there really isn't any opportunity to put God's image on display because man is putting God's image on display when man uses what God blesses him with and then he uses that to exercise dominion over the world that God has given to him. That's just not on display and that's not in view when we're, we're considering something like wagering. So those are some views on how uh, investing is different from wagering. Another question that comes up that says, what's the harm in wagering? Only a small amount. I'm only going to be wagering a little bit. What's so harmful about that? It's very, very small compared to my overall compensation. It's a very, very small piece of my budget. It's not a big deal. And so uh, the reasoning there is that um, if the amount being wagered was small, then that will alleviate any concerns uh, related to the activity itself because of the, the size of what is being wagered. But the issue in wagering here is not the degree to which a person's financial status is at risk. That's not the issue. The more significant issue here really is contentment. And contentment is in view regardless of the amount that's being wagered. Uh, Philippians 4, we looked at this again last week. Paul writes, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. So some questions that arise out of this. Even if you're wagering just a small amount, 
Are you content with the provision the Lord has entrusted to you? What is your drive? What is your your desire? What is your motivation for having a little bit more than what the Lord has entrusted to you and to obtaining that outside of the means that God has given you and that he's prescribed by which you would earn those resources? Another question is, do you long to have more than you have, even if it's only a little bit more? What is driving that longing to have more than what you have? Do you doubt that God is truly working for your good with the portion that he has clearly already given to you? Regardless of whether you're wagering a small amount or a large amount, uh, the issue is the same. You're not content with the amount that you have. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of the money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The love of money doesn't necessarily mean the love of lots of money. It means finding your contentment, security, joy in some amount other than what God has kindly, graciously provided to you. And then there's the issue of stewardship as it relates to gambling even a small amount. It's important to remember that whatever amount you allocate to wagering does not belong to you. It doesn't belong to you at all. It belongs to the Lord. We looked at Psalm 24 last week. Psalm 24 says, the earth and all it contains is the Lord's, those, the world and those who dwell in it. So the money itself doesn't belong to you, even if it's a little amount, it doesn't belong to you. And the way to put this into view is considering, consider that you're borrowing a friend's car and it doesn't matter whether that friend's car is nicer than your car or it's not as nice as your car. What if you told your friend, I plan to be very careful with your car 95% of the time that I'm driving it. And I'm not going to be careful the rest of the time. We don't do that. We're we're careful with our friend's car the entire time we drive it because it always belongs to them. It is always theirs. It's theirs 95% of the time and it's theirs the other 5% of the time as well. In the same way, we need to be good stewards of all that God has entrusted to our care because it is in the entrustment and the stewardship of all of those resources that we put his image on display. So that's a brief view at the issue of of just gambling or wagering a small amount. Another question that that comes up and that's found fairly often is, what if I limit the amount that I'm willing to lose? What if I somehow say to myself, "I, I will not lose more than a certain amount. Perhaps the person has a a detailed budget that includes a small amount for wagering. They look at it and they see it and they view it as a hobby on the side. And perhaps the budget's been working well for a really long time. They say, I've got this budget, I've had this small line item in my budget for a long time, so what could be wrong with that? But we need to understand that that a budget is a tool that assists us in our stewardship of the resources that God has entrusted to us. The existence and the fact that the budget leads us into a place that is solvent is not an affirmation of any line item in the budget by itself. But the answer still lies in the ownership of the funds being wagered. Again, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, those who live in it. Going back to the analogy of borrowing our friend's car, we wouldn't tell our friend, look, uh, I'm going to drive in a way that will limit the damage to your car. I'm going to drive in a way that will will limit it. I'll just break off the mirror on the side, but um, I won't ruin your transmission. We wouldn't tell our friend that. We simply don't have the freedom to use God's resources that he has not authorized in his word. That's the principle there. And then there's the issue that comes up where, and this is a very good question. I think this happens a lot of times. People say, what about wagering when no money is is involved? What about wagering when there's no money whatsoever involved? This is an organization that gets together. It's a group of people that gather together. It's usually around some pool or some bracket or some league where points are assigned, but there's no money involved. What's happening is friends are getting together. They're enjoying Fellowship around some sporting event, probably enjoying fellowship around that sporting event in ways that weren't entirely possible 15 years ago. Uh, But overall, the nature of the whole event is pretty winsome. 
There's, there's no money involved and, and nobody is really trying to scratch any itch of greed or discontentment or anything like that. And there's a lot of good in that. There's a lot of good in that. There's fellowship, there's opportunities to enjoy things together. It gives you something to do with somebody else. And there's a lot of good in gathering together around what God has given to us to enjoy. And so inherently by itself, there's, there's nothing sinful in that. It's, it's really, really pleasing and winsome for people to get together, to enjoy fellowship, to enjoy some good time together, and to, to have a great time together. Um, we want to just make sure when we consider that, that participation in that activity doesn't hinder our walk with the Lord in any way. And there's lots and lots of people where that's the truth. They, they can enjoy an activity like a pool or a bracket or some other fantasy league, and it has absolutely no bearing on their walk with the Lord. It's no hindrance whatsoever. And that's really good. Uh, Colossians 3.2 is, is a really good passage to keep in mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. So we ask ourselves, does our involvement in a, a pool or a bracket or some kind of fantasy league where there's no money involved prevent me from setting my mind on the things above? Probably not. And if it doesn't, this is a really good thing. We, we considered what those things above are when we were looking at this last week. Uh, the things above are the things that are described in Colossians 3, 4, just two verses later. Christ, who is our life, when he's revealed, then we will also be revealed with him in glory. So when we're setting our mind on things above, we're, we're setting our mind on, on the future and what is coming, when we are going to be revealed with Christ when he returns to establish his rule and reign on this earth. And if our life is, is characterized by reminding ourselves of that and, and keeping that in mind as we go throughout our lives, and we can maintain an activity or involvement in some kind of pool or some kind of bracket, then that's a good thing. There's nothing harmful in that at all. But if the involvement in that pool or that bracket or league or whatever it is becomes so significant to you in your mind that it's what your thoughts drift to when you're in your downtime, it's what your thoughts consistently go to, it's what occupies your mind and your heart, that's taking a big, pretty big place in your mind, and you might want to consider that. You can tell where a person's greatest affections are by what occupies their mind and what occupies their time. Another passage that's helpful when evaluating this is Philippians 2.4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. And the idea of interest there involves primarily the spiritual good of others, the well-being of others, but their spiritual good. So does your involvement in a pool or a bracket or something like that occupy your mind to the extent that it's difficult for you to talk with your friends about the things that really matter in life or difficult to get to those subjects? Uh, do you find yourself that the first thing you're talking about when you meet up with your friend is not, how was your week? How are you doing? How is the Lord working in your life? But you run to the other subject. Um, that's a concern. That's something to evaluate carefully. Um, are your primary conversations with your friend, how is your heart? How are you counseling your heart with truth? How are you using truth to help you navigate the circumstances of your life? If that is the heartbeat of your life and you happen to have other things in your life like fantasy leagues or brackets or pools, wonderful. Your friends are still blessed. You're still playing an active role in the body of Christ. Another issue that's raised quite often is the issue of entertainment. Uh, is wagering sinful as a means of entertainment? Sometimes the, the argument that's given or the point that is given is, this is just entertainment. I'm only using this for entertainment. And that's where it stays. But the question here tries to put a wagering in the same category as other entertainment. It tries to put it on the same level, in the same arena as other forms of entertainment. And scripture doesn't really address the issue of entertainment, but it does mention pleasure on a number of occasions. And it's not surprising that the one who addresses that is Solomon. And he does so in Ecclesiastes. And when Solomon speaks of pleasure here, he's talking about God honoring pleasure. He's not talking about a sinful pleasure like the enjoyment of many women, a harem, or uh, too many orchards, or too many horses, or anything like that. Ecclesiastes 8.15 Solomon writes, so I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink and be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. 
So Solomon's wisdom to us is God has given us days under the sun. And we will toil throughout those days. We, we know that reality. And the man, who's enjoyed, the man is to enjoy his life that God has given to him. And that enjoyment will stand by him in those toils. And, and God didn't design man to work 24-7. None of us who were here have been working 168 hours since we were here last time. Instead, God gave man the capacity to earn a surplus of provision in a reasonable amount of time that extends somewhat beyond his basic needs. And so God gave man the, the ability to enjoy good things with that surplus. But we're to find our enjoyment in those good things that God has given us. And again, we, we need to remember what good things are. They're things that allow us to bear God's image. This is where Genesis 1 is, is really helpful. We looked at this last time. Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 1, 28. In verse 26, God says, let's make man in our image and let's have him rule. So triune Godhead says, we, we want to see man in our image and we want man to rule over what we've created. And so when God thinks about bearing his image, he thinks about man exercising his dominion over things. And then in verse 28, God blessed man, and he said two things. He said, be fruitful and multiply, and then he said, subdue the earth. And the idea behind subduing is to use what God has blessed us with to exercise rule for our flourishing in this world. And so the good things are the things that put that flourishing and that dominion on display. An example for that is, is we work hard. And we enjoy the fruit of our hard work and our labor by going someplace that we've never been before and observing God's creation or using the fruit of our labor to buy that book that we've wanted to buy. And we purchase the book and we read it and we come to understand God better because of the reading of that book, whether it's his creation or his nature or something that has happened with the blessing that God has given. Or perhaps we use the fruit of our labor to bless or purchase something that blesses others. We own something and others can use it, and it's a blessing to them. It's a blessing to us as well. So these are the good things that put our flourishing and our dominion on display. So we find our entertainment and our joy in the things that are a blessing to us and a blessing to others as well. And that's what bears God's image. And that's what our task is, is to bear God's image. That's what God had in mind when he created us. And it involves good stewardship and wagering just it doesn't bear God's image because it doesn't put man, um, man's dominion on display. He's not using the resources God has given him for something that is good, for something that contributes to human flourishing. In fact, it does the opposite. It reduces, and in some cases, it actually eliminates his surplus. So he's less able to enjoy the fruit of his labor in the way that we just looked at. So that's a little bit of thought on the idea of wagering as entertainment. And the heart of the issue there is that it doesn't, the entertainment itself doesn't involve something that involves human flourishing in some way. Another question that relates to wagering is, is it sinful if it's done privately? What if it's just something that I do on my own on a Friday night or a Tuesday night or something else, and it doesn't really involve anybody else? It's done privately, so it shouldn't be a problem, right? Right? And the idea behind this is that uh, whatever a person does in their private life really has consequences that are limited to them. That's the thought. But there are some passages to consider in light of this. These are very helpful to us. And this is a passage that we've looked at many times. We're familiar with it in our church. We, we keep it in front of the whole body. It's Ephesians chapter 4 uh, in pre-service prayer. One of the people in pre-service prayer was actually praying through this passage as we were praying for this service this morning. I want to read this passage to you. And as I do, uh, notice that this passage is talking about the body of Christ and how the body of Christ is fitted or connected together and how the body of Christ is to supply to one another what is needed for its proper operation. These are wise words that, that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. 
from, the whole, from whom the whole body, fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The body causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And if you look in the middle of verse 16, you see how it does that. Believers are speaking the truth to one another in love, but they can only do that when you look in the middle of verse 16 when they're fitted and held together. These are people whose lives are interconnected pretty well. We, we know this here. We're talking together. We're sharing our lives with one another. We're sharing our burdens. We're sharing our joys. We're helping one another. We're praying for one another. We're encouraging one another. That kind of thing is happening a lot at Grace Bible Church, and I'm very, very, very thankful for that. I see that in my small group. I see that in lots of other small groups. I see it right outside of this sanctuary on, on Sunday. It's really, really encouraging. When it comes to bearing God's image by being stewards of what he's entrusted to us, we can't speak that message of integrity. We can't speak the truth in love to one another if we're not practicing that in our own lives. So the activity of privately engaging in something where we're looking to enhance our situation outside of the means that God has given to us inhibits our ability to actually function in the body of Christ with integrity. We only fit together well when we're working properly. And that means that we're aiming at what God is aiming for with us that our thoughts about our provision are the same as God's thoughts about provision for us. So when we entertain some thought about provision outside of God's means for us, it actually inhibits our ability to function together. And that's what is at the heart of the body of Christ. It's, it's one another being fitted together. It's one another loving one another. It's one another praying together. And our ability to, to do that well is hindered by participating in some kind of aim at provision for ourselves that's beyond what God has deemed for us and prescribed for us. So the effect is, is like this. Let's, let's say we have a guy who's pretty involved in wagering. And uh, he's involved to the extent that that wagering is dominating his thinking. Because he's always thinking about the money that's on the line, money that he earned last week and lost the week before and hopes to earn again this week. Now his conversations with other people in the body are going to be much more shallow, much less deep, much less comprehensive, much less caring. He's going to have a harder time speaking to one another with the, the intent and the purpose of building one another up. He might actually be aiming to do that and trying to do that, but he's going to be ineffective in doing that as a whole because his whole, his whole life is not aiming at that same thing himself. And so what happens is the whole body is missing the input of his life. It, it probably starts in his small group. When it comes time for, for guys' night and core questioning or whatever, he's less able to speak words of encouragement to another man who's wrestling with his own sin because he's up to his eyebrows in his sin. And when he does speak words, he speaks those words, and those words lack some integrity. And, and God is not pleased to use the words of a man who, who doesn't have the integrity of his own life behind those words. So it does have bearing on others. It might be your own funds. It, it might be limited to your own household. But it has bearing on others because it affects the way in which you interact with others pretty well. Another question that's, that's asked is, it relates to whether Scripture expressly forbids wagering. So show me a chapter and verse. I want to go to a page in my Bible where I can see this. We know that when we read the Proverbs, we're, we're looking at Inspired scripture, we know that it's inspired, but these, uh, these, in, these scriptures are truisms, they're truths that Solomon wrote, and they speak to the general principles that can be applied to our life. And one of the, the passages that's very, very helpful for us to look at is Proverbs 13, verse 11. And Solomon writes, wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. And so the key word here at the beginning of the verse is fraud. And the meaning of that word relates to nothingness or emptiness. So it's talking of material gain that is gotten outside of God's design. Obtaining something by nothingness, obtaining something by something outside of God's design. And God says that those resources dwindle. Remember Genesis 3, in the curse after the fall, God is speaking to Adam and he says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. 
Work itself is God's gracious means of provision to a man in this fallen world. So to try to come by wealth or provision in some way outside of God's design will cause those resources that you obtain to dwindle. And they will dwindle not because the money itself has some sort of half-life. That's not the point here. Rather, the wealth will dwindle because of the character of the person who has come across that wealth in the way that they have. The man of that kind of character, money falls through his hands like water through a net. It has nothing to do with the money itself. It has everything to do with the man and his ability to steward it well. He's an exceedingly poor steward of the funds that he has because he looks at obtaining those funds in means other than what God has provided. And very literally, easy come, easy go. Very happy to have the money come very easily, but because of the kind of man he is, it will go very easily. And that's why the one who gathers by labor increases the wealth that he gathers by that labor. The man who honors the Lord by participating in his design for provision is the kind of man who stewards really well. He makes good spending decisions. He makes good saving decisions. He makes good giving decisions because he feels the weight of the work that is required to obtain the provision that he does. It doesn't come easily to him, so it doesn't go easily either. So God's testimony to man is this. If, if you have a fondness for obtaining means and provision by means other than what I've provided, the kind of man you will become will erode the resources and will reduce their benefit to you. It has everything to do with the man. So the idea here is not to look for a chapter and verse that says, can't do this. Uh, there's greater strength in looking at the kind of man you become when you participate in this kind of activity. And you ask yourself whether or not that is what put God's image on display. One of the other questions that, that is put in place is, what should I do if I'm invited to participate in wagering? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can take our time and, and evaluate the request, evaluate, evaluate the invitation, and ask ourselves, is it the kind of activity that makes it difficult for us to put God's image on display? We consider our position as believers in the world. It's to put God's image on display, to explain and, and display his character to the world around us. And evaluate what your involvement in that, that activity would be like to those who are involved in it. Consider the, the role that you have, and it's, it's really, the issue isn't really the, the wagering itself. The issue is, what does that say about you and your objective of representing Christ in this world? And each opportunity and each situation needs to be evaluated on its own basis and on its own merit. But consider the, the kind of representation you make of the gospel to others when, you, when you're involved to participate in something. There might be a really winsome, joyful, encouraging way to say, I'm going to pass. There might be a good opportunity to explain to somebody the principles that you live by and, and how it is that God has brought you to the place where you are by the provision that he has given you through the means of provision that he has or whatever. But, but keep the objective in mind of, of representing God to the world around you, of being a good steward, being content, worshiping him. So what we're going to look at now is, is um, in the last few minutes together, is looking at man's responsibilities we want to look at four things that, that God has given man responsibility for. There are many, many more, but in the time we have, I'm just going to address these things. Um, and the first thing we're going to look at is man and his worship. And we looked at this with several passages last week, that man is created for worship. And we, we go nowhere first other than Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall fear the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. We need to remember that God created us to be worshipers. This is the instructions that God is providing to Israel just prior to their entry into the promised land. And God says, you will love me and you will worship me and you will fear me. That is how the world around you will know me is by how you interact with me. And God is clear that that worship should be directed at him. This means that God is at the center of our thought life. We don't worship God if he's not at the center of our thought life. We worship God in our work by thinking about how to do our work unto Christ. 
A husband and wife worship God in their marriage when they strive for the kind of unity that reflects the oneness that the triune Godhead has together. That's worship. We worship God in our leisure when we worship the creator more than we worship the creation that we're enjoying. And that's what's at the heart of worship. Wagering denies man the opportunity to worship God. That's because what's at the heart of worship is acknowledging our position under God and our dependence upon him for his provision to us, for all of our needs. Wagering flies in the face of that because it's looking for provision outside of God's means. So it makes it hard for us to put ourselves under God's provision and in need under God and difficult for us. So first and foremost, we need to be worshipers and we need to think about how, and our provision has a means of that and has, it relates to that. We can't worship God rightly if we don't understand our provision rightly and we're not running rightly after that, that form of provision. So we have a responsibility to worship God. We also have a responsibility uh, to our marriage. If you're married, this is really, really good for us to think about. If you're not married, this is really good for you to think about in the day that the Lord may have for you to be married. The amount of time that a person can allocate to wagering can be significant. Maybe the activity itself isn't extremely time-consuming, but the way that it controls their thoughts, the amount of time that they're thinking about it is significant. If a guy feels the need to blow off some steam, he gives himself permission to dabble in wagering for a while, and perhaps it turns into something where he's spending a lot of time either directly involved in it or thinking about it or talking about it. Ephesians 5, we know this, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Any married man knows that, who loves God knows that loving your wife well takes time. It takes an awful lot of time. It takes an awful lot of thought. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of sacrifice. So if you aren't taking the time necessary to study your wife and know your wife well, and your marriage actually shows that, but you seem to have time to engage in some kind of wagering that is taking up a big amount of your time, then are you really loving your wife the way Christ loved the church and giving yourself up the way Christ gave himself up? We understand that we're not giving ourselves up to purchase anybody's salvation, but the way we die to ourself is a picture of the way Christ went to the cross and gave up his own life for those he would purchase to himself. It might be a really good idea for someone who's involved in wagering to any substantial amount to think carefully about the vows that he made to his wife and the principles that are behind those vows, the principles of headship and leadership. Think carefully about the amount of time that is necessary to do those things well and to be mindful of all times of the fact that Christ gave himself up. So a man needs to be first and foremost willing to give himself up for his wife. Another area, and I... Most people will probably know that I would say this, but a man needs to be very faithful in his parenting. A man involved in wagering needs to think about the impact that this has on his, on his parenting. Ephesians chapter 6 is a really good place to go. We, we know this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And this is where Scripture is addressing children directly. The authority of Scripture is being brought right to bear on kids. It, it hits them right between the eyes. You are to obey your parents because this is what is right. And that is what is explicit in this verse. But what's implicit in this verse is that parents are to raise their kids by consistently explaining to them God's design for the family. And the design is this, that God places children under the authority of their parents because children lack the wisdom that they need to navigate this life on their own. That's why God gave you parents. And the parents are to teach this truth to their children again and again and again and again and again and again. And that takes time. And it takes effort. And it takes a lot of heart shepherding to do that in a way that's winsome. If wagering is a part of your life to the extent that you lack the time or you lack the interest in raising your kids well, that man is neglecting the mandate that God has placed upon him as a father. And his love for the wagering is at the root of that. So men need to be faithful to their parenting. Drop down to verse 4. This is really helpful. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, 
Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them up doesn't mean barking out the instructions when they stray from your instructions. Look at the end of the verse. It means disciplining them and instructing them in what is of the Lord. And that takes lots of time. That takes lots of energy. And it takes an awful lot of heart shepherding to do that well. Here are a few questions to ask dads. Who does most of the instruction of the kids in this household? Who does most of the correction of the kids? Who does most of the teaching from scripture of the kids? Who does most of the discipline? Another question is, am I aware of what my kids are doing while I'm with them? Or am I so involved in other things like wagering that I'm disconnected from their lives and not really shepherding them well? The verse actually tells us, do not provoke your children to anger. Well, one of the simplest, most easy, most common ways that a father can provoke his children to anger is to correct them when they're in sin without teaching them how to be fruitful in their life first. So a man needs to be faithful to his parenting. The last thing we really have time for this morning is a man needs to be faithful to his work. When something like wagering becomes increasingly pervasive in a man's life, it begins to encroach on how he uses his time. And when it gets to its extreme, you have a man who is using his lunch hour, he's using the first part of his workday, or he's using the last part of his workday. He's using the time that God has given him to work for something like wagering. And it becomes a bigger and bigger part of his life. And eventually it becomes so bad that it explodes on him. When he's supposed to be working, he's, in, he's engaging in the thing that actually ends up destroying him. A verse that's very, very helpful when we think about that is Proverbs 26, 14. It's almost humorous to read this, but it's sobering when we think of the extent that a man has to get to for this to be true about him. But it's certainly true because Solomon wrote about it. Solomon writes in Proverbs 26, 14, as the door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns on his bed. And maybe the man isn't on his bed, maybe he's at his desk or he's got his mouse pad and he's got his clicker, um, but he's just turning and he's turning and he's turning. He's not actually working. So there's a responsibility that the man has there to his work. There's a warning within it. He gets there very gradually. He gets there by trimming off a few minutes here and there. He gets there by slowly but surely, more deeply becoming involved in something that, that ends up consuming more and more of his life. So a man needs to be faithful to his responsibility to worship. He needs to be faithful to his marriage. He needs to be faithful to his parenting. He needs to be faithful to his work. So these are principles that can help us think rightly about this. My heart is that this would be a blessing to us. And again, as I look out in this crowd, I'm not looking at a group of people who are going, oh, I'm buried in debt with gambling. Um, but these principles apply to any area of our life. It's anything that has significant place in our life. We need to make sure that we're ones who are stewards of our life. We're ones who worship God rightly, ones who are content with the, the season God has given us. So I hope this is a blessing to you all. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these dear people. I thank you for this church. I thank you for your design for provision to us. And I thank you for your design for our relationship with you. I pray that we would be people who delight in your provision to us through your means. I pray that we would be people who love to bear your image well to the world around us. I pray that you would help us to do that well in the rest of our service today. Lord, that we would worship you well. We would love you well. We would love one another well. We would teach one another. Lord, we would do this all to your glory, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.